Does the NBA season end tonight? And we renew the argument with Howard Beck of whether or not it's a new NBA or not. It's all next on this edition of Locked On NBA. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, founder of the Locked On Podcast Network, original host of Locked On NBA. He's Howard Beck. He's Locked On's NBA offseason and playoff expert. And this is Locked On NBA, your daily podcast covering the NBA in 30 minutes or less to give you everything you need to know of what's going on on today's show. We will talk about game five as the end of the NBA season looms and David stares at the television in depression if that happens. Nikola Jokic, kind of interesting retro on some conversations. Howard and I had a little debate the other day about the new NBA. We'll touch on the social media world stars are growing up in and how this group seems to be failing a bit. And also the off-season tenor of what we expect to have happening. That's all coming up on today's show. This is brought to you by Prize Picks. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. From Denver, Colorado, working on a story for GQ. He's Howard Beck. Is it over tonight? Uh, I hate making predictions. Um, I, I, I think it probably is. But famous last words, and uh, we in the media tend to root for things to just be over so that we don't have to keep bouncing back and forth between cities and games. Um, and the universe always conspires against us as soon as we're, we get ahead of ourselves. So I, I would just say that the Heat have not shown uh, much ability in this series to, to just generate enough offense. I know we obsess over, rightfully, the, the dynamism of the Nuggets offense, of Jokic's passing and his triple doubles and Jamal Murray and his triple doubles and just the, the beauty of the game that the Nuggets are playing, all of which is, is right to focus on. But the bottom line is that what I feel like is doing in the heat ultimately here is the same thing that I thought was their weakness all season. The reason that I didn't wasn't surprised necessarily that they slipped some in the regular season and the reason that I did not think they were going to make it this far in the playoffs, right? Like the heat have defied all expectations. Well, part of that defying expectations is defying the fact that they just have never had a ton of offensive punch and they've gotten this far without their second best scorer in Tyler hero. So, you know, to me, we can talk what we want about the heat's difficulty in trying to contain the nuggets all true, but the fact is that the Heat have had a deficit of offense for the entire season, or actually really this entire run with Jimmy Butler. They've always been a team that was going to, if they're going to beat you, they're going to beat you with their defense. They're not going to just outscore you. And, you know, uh, Jimmy Butler has not been able to get untracked in this series, clearly. And if he's not, then who is? Yeah, I mean, I think this one gets super simple. and I, I'm not trying to, like, overly simplify it, but, like, I actually would phrase it just slightly differently when people ask me right now about this series, it's like, okay, Denver's offense is percolating at like a basically 120 points per hundred possessions, which would make them the number right behind Sacramento. It's like one of the greatest offenses in the history of the NBA. Like you, you just can't beat someone four out of seven games if their offense is at that level. And then when like you start to break it down a little bit, it gets even more extreme. Like the first quarters, for whatever reason, Denver hasn't been, but their offensive rating in second quarters of this series, Howard is 137. Like there are these stretch, like their third quarter offense is a 120. Their first fourth quarter offense slows back down, but they've been ahead by so much that like, okay, great. Like, I mean, their, their offense is just at a level. And I do think if there's a lesson from these playoffs, which when your team's not in the playoffs anymore, that's what you try to do is like, what's the lesson? The lesson is you got to be able to shoot and you got to be able to score. Like defense is nice and you, and Denver's played it but you have to be able to shoot and you have to be able to score at an alarmingly high rate in this league right now. Yeah. And that has been the Nuggets calling card over the last few years. And the only reason we weren't sure if they would make it to this point was would they play enough defense? You knew they could score at an elite level at a historically elite level. We always wondered if the Nuggets could play enough defense. Their defense has been great. Um, but again, aided by the fact that the Miami heat are not a team with a lot of firepower. They just never have been in this iteration. And, you know, whether Jimmy is hurt and it's about that or whether it's just, you know, maybe the Nuggets are just simply doing a good job on him. And they do have some some really nice perimeter defenders to throw at him. 
the but this this Heat team was never built on its ability to just get buckets, and they're they're hamstrung in that regard. And I'm not saying if if uh, I'm not saying that trying to outscore the Nuggets is necessarily a formula for defeating them four out of seven, as you note about the how, just how elite their offensive efficiency is. Um, but man, uh, if, if you <laughs> You have to be able to generate more than the Heat are, and they, they they just can't. And so, no, I don't think they're getting back in this. All right, so uh, this is probably a conversation for tomorrow after Denver wins, but it's percolating around the league right now, and I think it's super interesting. Sometimes I think we make these things up because we need something to talk about in two days off. Sometimes I think they're super interesting. I'm going to go with this one. super interesting. So Denver wins tonight. They're 16-4. and four. Like, it's a pretty dominating run. The discussion has been that we have no dominating teams left, that we have parity, and that there's been, you know, I talked about a lot. There's no big plus 11 differential team anymore. There's the discrepancy between top and bottom. Miami's the example that they're an eight seed. Then there's the argument that, well, they played a play-in team and they did this. Like, where, what's your feeling on this with Denver, if they win tonight at 16-4, and four, clearly with the best player in the world at this point? Um, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, to be honest. You know, there have been some postseason teams, you know, I think of that, you know, Shaq and Kobe Laker team that went to the finals, was undefeated when they got to the finals, lost game one to the Sixers, and then, you know, and then steamrolled them the rest of the way. So they ended up at whatever that was. I think that was 15 and one back in the day, because that was still the best of five first round. Um, there's the Warriors team that got to the, fi- I think the Warriors went to the finals undefeated at least once during that run during the Durant years. Right. Um, so there are some of these teams that stand out because they got to the finals undefeated. They barely lost along the way. Um, I don't know how many teams have won the championship with only four losses. I'm guessing there's been, you know, or, or fewer, I'm guessing there's been a handful. Um, so I don't know what kind of, uh, company that puts them in just on the win loss ledger for the postseason. I think we're always going to look at this postseason as a strange one though. And that's not to asterisk the, the nuggets accomplishment or anything else, but if you're asking for a historical perspective, what are we going to rank the nuggets being up there as dominant as the Curry Durant warriors or the Shaq and Kobe Lakers in 2001? Like, no, like, I, no, it's not. It's, it's not. And listen, there are plenty of seasons where a team has a quote unquote easier path to the finals or a, a, you know, a, a lesser, uh, upon like even, you know, hell that Sixers team that the Lakers faced in 2001 really wasn't that good. The East wasn't very good, but the West was a beast. And so, um, you had to take out, you know, a, a great Blazers team or a great Spurs team or a great Kings team. In, in those seasons, the West was incredibly competitive at the top. This isn't one of those years. And, you know, the Suns were in flux because of the midseason trade they made. The Lakers were in a, a certain state of flux. Um, so, like, it, it's it's not diminishing the Nuggets' accomplishment to fairly assess uh, what the path was, right? Um, it's never easy. Every championship is equal. They all matter. And it's a great accomplishment. But I, but the 16-4 and four is not going to make me put them up there with all-time dominant teams. They're not built that way you know Jokic and Murray at, at least at this point and hey you know what they've got plenty of time left maybe they will be uh this generation's Shaq and Kobe for all we know um I think that would be heresy just even saying that out loud to a lot of people um and you know those those two are all-time greats and Jokic is already an all-time great and Jamal Murray has done a lot of really amazing things um but when we talk about the all-time dominant championship teams it's partially the record it's partially how they got there, and it's partially who they have and where we put those players in the pantheon. The Nuggets have one of those guys, so I don't think we should get carried away with the 16-4. and four. It's Here's why I think it's really interesting, and this we could really go down a rabbit hole here, but I do think the league's very different. Like, you and I are going to talk about this in the next part of the show, and we're a little bit different in opinions on this, I think. I think the super team is dead. I think that this is a new era, and I think we're done with the dominant team, which actually, to some way makes it to me harder to be as dominant as Denver may have been in this playoffs than ever before. Right? Like Shaq and Kobe and they, the league rules allowed them to add pieces. And you go back to those teams. It was hard. You know, you, you could do things in those eras that I'm not sure Denver could do building this roster. So there's some ways that I actually find this equally as impressive, not more so, but just equally as impressive as any other team that's gone 
through a playoff as dominantly. This is going to turn out to be, I mean, they're a nine point favorite on FanDuel tonight. Like this is no longer classified as a close series. So it's interesting to me. I'm a little bit more on the side of like, all right, in this era of what the rules are and what the game is and how the teams are kind of maybe sandwiched, this might be even more impressive to be this dominant. I don't know if it makes it more impressive. I, I just, I think what when we start weighing, and this becomes so, um, but I have the beholder stuff, and this becomes so contextual depending on the year, but when we start ranking championship runs or when we and, and that's what you're doing when you're saying most impressive what's the most impressive version of it or how impressive is this version of it it forces the discussion to then bring into things like well who are the opponents and listen the nuggets won't be the first team to win a championship by beating kind of a a a a, a less than stellar less than historic finals opponent right what the heat have done is amazing and it is historic but they're not historically talented but listen the Spurs have five championships and we don't talk about who they beat in those championships. One of which was an eighth seeded Knicks team in 1999 at the end of a lockout season. Phil Jackson joked about putting an asterisk next to that, but no one's ever really done that. So it, it nothing gets diminished, but it is fair to say, well, who did the Spurs beat those years? And then you start looking at it. And some of those years they had lesser opponents than others in the finals. The Heat, as an eighth seed that had the seventh best record in the East, um, that had to play a play-in game to, to get to the finals in the first place, beating them is not the most impressive thing to me. Like, I, I'm sorry. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, they, they took out the Bucs and they took out the Celtics, and, and that was impressive. But, like, this is just a really strange season. It was a really strange season where the top two teams in the East both got taken out by an eight seed, and the West was in a state of flux. And... You know, so I, the championship is the championship, but it, but I'm I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, there's no way of framing this that that's make me feel like like this is more impressive than it is. It's 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 impressive on its own. I, I don't, it doesn't need anything extra. He is Howard Beck. He's locked on NBA playoff and off season expert. I'm David Locke, and this is locked on NBA. We'll talk about whether this is the new world that we have coming up with the NBA here shortly. Today's show is brought to you by Better Help. The world can be tough. The world can be overwhelming. The world can make you question. And BetterHelp is here to help you through it, help you become a better person. That's what BetterHelp is here for. It's so easy to get caught up in everything everyone else needs from you. It's easy to play the comparison game. It's easy to wonder, why did I react the way I reacted to that? I don't like what I did in retrospect. Those are the things that you can get help with and you can benefit from therapy and feel and for you to understand why you're experiencing what you are. It's all at BetterHelp. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist. And I love this. You can switch therapists at any time. If anyone out there has tried to get a therapist recently, it's brutal. So BetterHelp is here for that. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on N-B-A. David Locke along with Howard Beck, and thanks to Howard for his time as always. He is in Denver today. Uh, if for your second listen today, Locked On Heat, Locked On Nuggets, those guys have been killing it, doing incredible coverage on everything. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen. All right, Howard. We talked about this a little bit the other day, and I really think – I, I, I'm of the school that had it not been for the Durant move to the Warriors, we'd be in like the ninth year of this new parody NBA. And instead, we're kind of in the third year of parody NBA, fourth year, maybe fifth, maybe first, depending on your viewpoint. You don't you think we're still going to see the forming of super teams? And you do you think one thing we didn't get to I actually went back and listened to our old conversation is we I never got a clarity. You think they'll still form. I agree with that. Do you think they'll work? Do you think that we're going to have super team success in the future? Or do you think what we're watching out of Denver, which is draft and then add the Aaron Gordon, make a really good move to Bruce, um, go get the Contavious Caldwell Pope building of a roster is the way we're going to see things done. So first, this depends on how people want to define super teams. And I don't think you and I even define them the, the same. So no, I'm going to totally disagreed on that because yeah. your my definition is acquired through free agency and you include drafting. So no, I, 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 I drafting it, it, on that. 
the Warriors were a super team of sorts before Durant got there because they had three guys who were all in the top 15 to 20 of the league and they drafted them all, but it's still a super team. You have, if you have three superstars, you have a super team. If you have three of the top 15 to 20 players in the NBA, you're a super team and it doesn't matter how you got them. And again, I don't rank drafting free agency and trades in any particular order of virtue. You get the talent that you get, however you get it. So a super team is just a team with um, at least three absolute studs um and i don't put two in there right so like the shack and kobe laker teams that i covered that was it was two of them they never had a third guy um i didn't consider them a super team some people would because they would say well they were a dynasty they had two guys who were you know all-time greats who were in the top 15 to ever play the game however you wherever you're putting shack and kobe in that ranking um I look at it as the beginning of the super team era. The modern super team era was when the Celtics acquired Ray Allen and, Ke and Kevin Garnett to go with Paul Pierce. That in turn sparks LeBron's move to Miami to join up with Wade and Bosch. And that sparks a bunch of copycats, most of whom flamed out terribly. Um, and eventually leads to Durant joining the Warriors as well. Um, I know David Locke wants to pretend that the cap spike didn't happen and it's just some alternate timeline, but I'm sorry, David, in the universe that we do live in, the spike did happen and Durant did go there and they were arguably a three-star three, three -star super team even before he got there. He just made them a four-star super team and possibly the most talented team we've ever seen. Um, so it's going to be harder now, right? Not only will there never be another cap spike, but the new CBA that's kicking in this summer is going to make it progressively more difficult to stack up max type players without getting in the weeds of cap minutia. I'll just say this, just because you can make the max and like the 35% max doesn't mean you have to. So the possibility of super teams in the future is going to possibly require guys wanting so badly to play together that they're willing to take less than what they are eligible for and or because there are different kinds of maxes there's the 25 percent of the cap max the 30 percent, the 35 if you somehow manage to get a bunch of guys who are really uh incredibly talented while they're still on their early maxes then you can stack up a couple of early maxes whereas it's really hard to stack up 35 percent maxes and especially if those guys have been in the league longer because now it's not even 35 percent it's 35 percent plus all the percentage raises you got over several years and now you're making way beyond what our quote unquote max is and the point is between luxury tax penalties and all these other things where they're going to take away cap exceptions and take away the ability to make trades and take away you're going to freeze draft picks in the future and then push them to the end of the first round. All these penalties for the highest spenders, it's going to make it hard to assemble and even harder to keep together a highly talented team. Even the Nuggets, as they prepare to win this first championship and are, and are charting out, trying to figure out how to keep this group together, are going to have some financial strains or I, I should say cap strains, right? It's not about their budget. It's more about the salary cap and the system around it. They're going to have some strains. They made a trade with Oklahoma last week in which they swapped a bunch of picks. And that was about trying to get some cheaper pieces, I think, in place or, you know, because draft picks are, are on, on a scale. So I, I don't know if we'll see another super team anytime soon because the system is going to make it very difficult. But I will never rule out the fact, the idea that it'll happen because somebody will do it. Either somebody will clear the decks the way the Miami Heat did in 2010 to add guys to an existing star or it'll be the, you know, a, a Daryl Morey or somebody going out and acquiring multiple guys as he's tried to, or as the Nets tried to when they briefly had Durant, Harden, and Kyrie. Um, you, you asked if, if if it'll work. It depends on who the three guys are. Like, it, it was not never going to work in Brooklyn because of of who they had. Um, when it hasn't worked in other places, it's it's been because, you know, at least one of the guys was like a star, maybe a name only, or wasn't wasn't elite enough. It can work. It just has to be the right three guys, and it's going to be really hard to do under the system. You buy any of the LeBron talk to Dallas? No. I didn't either. But I did wonder why he did that retirement thing. Like, I got to admit that that actually made me – like, the retirement thing to me was super weird because he's not going to retire because we all know that his goal in life is to play with Bronny. And that's been, like, talked about for, like – I mean, honestly, like, the great late Fred McLeod, who was the Cavaliers TV announcer, told me this – probably like eight or nine years ago, like, you know, LeBron's going to play with his son. And his son was like walking around the building at like 11 years old at the time. Um, so 
Like, I thought that was super weird. So that was the only reason I thought there was any validity to the Dallas thing is that I thought the retirement talk was super weird. LeBron, LeBron's not going to Dallas and Kyrie's not going to the Lakers. They're not playing together. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Um, I, I haven't believed any of this other stuff uh, on any of those fronts. Um, Le- LeBron does things for reasons. And I, I think that one had more to do with, you know, he's not a free agent, right? So, you know, that had more to do with keeping the pressure on the Lakers to do whatever they need to do. And maybe it was pressure to try to trade for Kyrie for all we know. Um, I think it was more just a generalized kind of pressure. Like, you know, th- th- this was a really hard season. You made it harder than it needed to be by waiting as long as you did to make those trades. Um, you know, don't screw up this off season. I think that's the message. I'm going to turn. I dream of genie, a little magic ball rubbing Howard back here in the next part of this. I do want to talk about social media, how it's impacting our stars, but I also wanted to get a little bit of like, I'm super buckled on where I think the off-season tenor is going to be and what's going to happen. So we'll talk to Howard about that as we continue here on Locked on NBA Today. Prize picks is a great way to be involved, have some fun, and hopefully win. Prize picks gives you a $100 match as a new user right now. That's the deal here. It's pretty great. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, they'll give you $50. Go to download Prize Picks app and go to prizepicks.com, sign up and play daily fantasy sports. You pick two to six players, quick and easy app right there, safe and fast, easy withdrawals. You can enter in 60 seconds or left. It's pretty great. Use the promo code locked on to enter the promo code and sign up for your instant deposit match up to $100. Today may be the final chance to win a million dollars as well, because every day during the NBA playoffs and the finals, one prize picks user will win a chance to become a millionaire. One entry after 8 a.m. Eastern will be randomly selected each day. Whoever's place that entry will get a six pick flex. You get all six, it's a million. If you get five, it's 80,000. If it's four, it's 16,000. I'd like to get 67% of my answers right on the test and get $16,000. That seems pretty great. Full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash a million. You must opt in. We'll do it now. Download the prize picks app. And remember, use the promo code locked on to get your instant deposit match up to $100. David Locke, along with Howard Beck here on locked on NBA. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Um, just quickly, I'm going to change the order of what we originally planned. Do you have any understanding yet of whether this new collective bargaining agreement is going to have a real chilling effect? It's not a great free agent class like Fred Van Vliet. Well, James Harden, I guess. Um, but like then like kind of Fred Van Vliet's like a high tier free agent. Like that's not great. Do you have any feel right now of what this offseason tenor is going to be and whether or not we have some chilling effect going on? with this new collective bargaining agreement. I, I will admit, I just want to, I want to actually say thank you because it was brilliant. And then you can really question whether I need to go talk to better help. Um, I did take an hour and a half and listen to Nate Duncan and Larry Kuhn on a dunked on podcast. That was a, basically the inside collective bargaining agreement, like details and like with notes and a notebook, like I was in the back of class again, I was right back to Occidental college. Um, so yeah, you can actually, check whether I need help. I did do that. I don't know though. Do you have a feel of whether or not this is a, a chilling effect here? It will, it will eventually, I think be a chilling effect on the free agent markets in future years could be um, this, this, you know, it, it's not like this is a big free agency summer anyway. You know, this, this is a typical summer in that we have a small number of teams with like max room or more um, and then another few that can get to a certain amount, you know, a decent amount of, of cap room. And they're mostly the teams that aren't not, are, you know, are not expected to, to be contenders. And so they're not necessarily destinations, right? Like James Harden's a free agent. James Harden's not going to, or, you know, Orlando or Detroit, right? Or, um, but he may be going back to Houston, uh, at least so the rumors persist. Um, you know, there's not a, there's not a lot of big time free agents. The ones that are out there are, are like Harden and Kyrie who both have like major caveats, you know, attached to them. Um, in terms of the chilling effect, I think the opposite is going to happen this summer. I think we're going to see absolute fireworks this summer in terms of movement because so many teams are now going to be trying to get their books in order. So they're going to be trying to offload salary. And it may not be superstar salaries, max salaries. It may be just some over tier, overpaid mid-tier guys. You know, um, It may be that much more incentive for the Warriors to offload Jordan Poole, right? 
that's the kind of contract I'm thinking of. Like guys who, you know, cashed out, you know, Tyler Hero could be on the move this summer for all we know. Um, like there's there's going to be a kind of a rebalancing of the NBA economy, I think, as teams reckon with all the impacts of this this new system. And they don't not all the penalties are coming right away or not all the restrictions are coming right away, but you need to start getting your your stuff in order right away. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of trades. And I think, I think the, the draft is setting us up for that too, because right. Like if Portland's keeping Dame Lillard, well, then they should be probably trading the third pick for immediate help. And the Rockets and Pistons, who I think are fourth and fifth in that order, um, also don't exactly need more 19 and 20 year olds, right? There are two teams that want to tr turn the corner soon. And so I just think between the draft, having a lot of, uh, young teams with high picks that they may or may not want to use. Those could be an, on the move and setting us up for, for big trades. The new CBA and teams trying to adjust to it, I think, sets up for that. So um, a chilling effect on free agency, perhaps, but on the market as a whole, when you consider trades, I think this is actually going to be a crazy summer. Interesting. Super interesting. Oh, wow. All right. That's awesome. All right. I, big picture conversation. I don't want to. Jaw is scary. Zion is like what page six was made for. It's not new. Um, it was pretty epic, frankly, like from a like fun gossip, like tell your friends, sit around a bar and, you know, like laugh about like pretty epic. Um, but to me, what actually jumped out to me about this, Howard, is like this is actually in where LeBron blows my mind because LeBron was the first star of the social media age where everything you're doing is on Instagram and Twitter. And, you know, I... I actually think like I go back to like Blake Griffin throwing the phone. Like we actually haven't had as many of these episodes as I would have thought the players have truly adapted and changed their behavior and are dealing with this. But this to me is kind of like this Zion and this jaw story. They're obviously both like they did what they did and they're not innocent of their actions, but they are, these are the total new age where nothing you're doing is private. Everything you're out is live, everything that's out there. And it just, I thought it was really, I don't know what I'm totally asking, but I just thought it was really eye-opening to one, like how impressive LeBron has been to generally stay out of it other than some blonde-haired freak on Fox News who decided to put him in the middle of a political war. And sorry, that was maybe not fair. I just thought it was unfair how she treated him. Um, but I also think like, I don't know. I just, I don't know. That's kind of, I'm going to leave it there. I don't have a total question. It's more of kind of a comment of the social media age are the players are growing up in. And we're seeing two guys who are not victims of it because they did what they did, but who have been exposed because of it. The perils of the social media era are high, right? The number of opportunities it presents for mayhem, whether it's self-created or somebody else, right? You can be ambushed places. You can be photographed places. You can be filmed places. Um, in the case of Zion last week, right, you can have people who, you know, you, you have, uh, you know, uh, relationships with uh, whatever else that normally would have been private in the past. And if they wanted to, to take it to the public, they would have to go to page six or, or do whatever. But now everybody's got this tool at their disposal where they can embarrass you or shame you or out you on 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 one thing or another in your private life. Um, so the perils of social media are that this generation of players face is, is, is unique, you know, or, or very different than what past generations of pro athletes uh, dealt with. But I think when we talk about John ja Zion, these are self-created problems largely, you know, 99 something percent. And in it, if social media didn't exist, a lot of this would have happened anyway. The things that Zion is going through right now, and I'm not going to get into detail about them. And if people don't know, just go Google it and, or, or don't Google it. I, I just, you know, I, None of it's great, but the 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 issues themselves would exist whether social media existed to convey them to us or not. Um, the judgments or or possibly poor judgments he's made. Same with Ja, because if if take the the two gun incidents aside, and those were aided by social media, right? He's he's waving guns around or what looked like guns on Instagram. And if Instagram doesn't exist, maybe those cases don't happen. But Ja would still have all these other issues, all the things that have been reported by The Athletic and The Washington Post, other you know run-ins with people of various sorts. So no matter what area you're in, whether social media exists or not, these are there's still some areas of just you know personal judgment and, and um, accountability issues. And those have always existed, of course. But social media does exacerbate everything. Yeah, I mean, the Ja thing, there's a lot 
there's a lot going on there. Like the Indiana, frankly, to me personally, the story about the Indiana post game is like top of that list. And I feel like it did not get, um, has not gotten the, 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 the highlighted issues or the gun and the things like that. All right. We'll see. Maybe I'm staring at the television in pure depression. It used to be baseball that did this to me. When I was a little kid and the last game of the World Series would happen, I would stare at the television and be like, it's over. What am I going to do? And tonight, I might be that. And then it's back to watching Nick Smith Jr. videos and I just could not. Hot boiling wax in my eyes if I have to watch another college game with a center sitting in the middle of the court and a talented guards not being able to drive through the middle of the lane and me being able to figure out where they can play in the NBA. That's a side <laughs> note. That's just a personal note right there. Howard Beck, thank you very much for the time. Enjoy Denver and Ball Arena tonight and maybe a championship city and all that goes with it. It's one of the special things in sports, so have a good one today. Appreciate it. Thanks.